What's going on everybody? This is Afro Think Tank. Today's video is going to be an educational video. Why you shouldn't waste your time going on all these social media panels debating idiots, debating pseudo scholars, debating people who seem to be experts at everything, but experts at nothing. Okay? And these are going to be the reasons why you see you don't see me waste my time on a lot of these these panels where you have all these people that come on same y'all know y'all know the group they come on these panels is usually the same characters and they seem to be PhD experts on every topic but they can never prove anything that they say they never give you sources they never cite anything they don't actually know how to debate and there's an art form to debating I used to actually be on a debate team right so that's why I don't waste my time debating people who don't even respect the format of uh, actual debating discourse that's why I don't do it. I want you guys to pay attention to this before you go and see another Tariq Nishi live stream on Twitter, Twitch, or whatever platform he's using on YouTube. I want you to pay attention to this video so you can be armed with the information necessary to be able to discern bullshit when you see it, right? When you look at, listen to people like Umar Johnson sometimes, because Umar Johnson is very intelligent, and that's the problem with him. He's intelligent and he knows what he's doing, right? But most of the time, it's people like Tariq Nasheed who's not really that intelligent at all, but he has enough charisma to pull off what he's pulling off. And you'll see the tactics utilize, uh, you'll see they'll break down the tactics that these people utilize when confronting people that do know what they're talking about and they're confronted with people that have actual information, actual sources, can cite where they get their information from. Because it seems like they is the source of all information for all these pseudo-scholars. They is the information for all these these PhD political sciences all of a sudden, right? They is the freaking, is, is the source of information for all these religious scholars and historians and everything. It's they. It's never a source that's reputable and that's been peer-reviewed by the peers within that uh, that particular category. But there's always they. Who's they? It's always they. They's always the go-to guy, the go-to source, right? So anyway, I want you guys to pay close attention to everything you hear in this video. And no, you should never waste your time talking to these guys. They're stuck in their own bubble, in their own uh, echo chambers, and there's no help in a lot of these guys. In the age of information, if they're still stuck in this pseudo, low vibrational, informational bubbles, they're never coming out. And they're just going to stay there, and you shouldn't waste your time, your stress, or your effort dealing with these people. And you shouldn't be helping them pass along and spread their false information to other people who are susceptible to that type of pseudo information. Okay? Anyway, that's all I got to say. It's Afro Think Tank. Learn something. Teach them. I'm out. Pseudo scholars on social media often use vague terms like they to source their information to create an illusion of authority or insider knowledge while avoiding accountability. By not specifying sources, they can make unsubstantiated claims seem credible without being challenged on the accuracy or reliability of the information. This tactic also exploits the ambiguity of they, which can be interpreted to mean experts, authorities, or institutions, further adding to the perception of credibility. Additionally, it allows them to shift blame or avoid responsibility if their information is debunked. Here are a few examples where pseudo-scholars might use they in a vague, misleading manner. 1. Health myths. They don't want you to know that natural remedies can cure all diseases. In this case, they might refer to pharmaceutical companies, doctors, or other unnamed authorities. The statement suggests a conspiracy without providing any real evidence or sources conspiracy theories, they are hiding the truth about alien life from the public. Here, they could imply the government, NASA, or some other unnamed organization. The vagueness helps the speaker avoid proving the claim. 3. Historical revisionism. They won't teach you the real history of ancient civilizations in schools because it contradicts mainstream beliefs. This suggests some shadowy educational authority without providing clear proof or sources to back up the claim. 4. Financial advice. They don't want you to know the secrets to getting rich because it threatens their control of the system. In this context, they might refer to banks, governments, or wealthy elites, implying hidden knowledge that the speaker claims to have. These examples rely on the vague, unnamed they to create a sense of mystery or suppression of information, but they lack concrete evidence or credible sources. It's a common rhetorical trick used to make unfounded ideas seem credible or to generate distrust in established institutions. Distinguishing between pseudo-information and real information requires critical thinking 
and evaluating several factors. Here are key ways to separate the two. 1. Source credibility. Real information comes from reputable, verifiable sources, academic journals, established news outlets, government agencies, or recognized experts in a field. These sources have a track record of accuracy, and their information is usually peer-reviewed or fact-checked. Pseudo-information often comes from vague or anonymous sources they, experts say, social media posts without citations, or individuals with no established credibility in the field they are discussing. 2. Evidence and references. Real information provides clear evidence, data, and references to credible research. It cites verifiable studies, expert opinions, or official statistics, and allows readers to check the sources. Pseudo-information lacks specific references or cherry-picks data out of context. It may also rely on anecdotal evidence or personal stories rather than verifiable facts. Er, 3. Logical consistency. Real information is logically coherent, follows established knowledge, and aligns with what is known from other credible sources. It doesn't rely on contradictions or extreme claims. Pseudo-information often uses logical fallacies, such as appeals to emotion, straw man arguments, or false dichotomies. It may also present wild claims that contradict well-established facts without strong evidence. 4. Transparency and accountability. Real information sources are transparent about how they arrived at their conclusions, their methods, and any limitations of their data. Authors are usually accountable for their work. Pseudo-information is often opaque, making broad, unverified claims. The author may evade responsibility by saying things like, they don't want you to know, or research has shown, without providing details. 5. Peer review and expert consensus. Real information is often supported by peer-reviewed studies and reflects a consensus among experts in the field. This doesn't mean it's free of error, but it's been scrutinized by other professionals. Pseudo-information typically rejects peer review or expert consensus, claiming that the mainstream is wrong or part of a conspiracy. It may promote fringe theories that have little or no support from the scientific or academic community. 6. Language and Tone Real information is generally measured and cautious. It avoids sensationalism and acknowledges uncertainties or nuances. Pseudo-information tends to be alarmist, overly confident, or exaggerated. It might use emotional or inflammatory language to provoke fear, anger, or excitement, rather than promoting understanding. 7. Fact-checking and cross-referencing. Real information can be cross-referenced with multiple independent, reputable sources. It holds up under scrutiny and fact-checking. Pseudo-information often falls apart when cross-checked or fact-checked by reputable organizations. It may only be supported by a narrow set of like-minded or biased sources. 8. Open to criticism. Real information is open to debate and evolves with new evidence. Genuine scholars are willing to revise their claims if new evidence emerges. Pseudo-information is often dogmatic, rejecting criticism or alternative viewpoints outright. It may insist that any dissent is part of a suppression effort by the establishment. By applying these principles, you can critically assess the quality and validity of the information you encounter. When pseudo-scholars or individuals promoting pseudo-information are confronted, they often resort to personal attacks for several psychological and strategic reasons. These attacks, known as ad hominem fallacies, shift the focus from the argument to the person making the critique. Here's why they might do this. 1. Deflection from weak arguments. When their claims lack evidence or credibility, personal attacks serve as a deflection tactic. Instead of addressing the critique directly, they attack the critic's character, intelligence, or motives. This distracts the audience from the weak points in their argument. 2. Emotional manipulation. Pseudo-scholars often rely on emotional persuasion rather than logical reasoning. By launching personal attacks, they aim to provoke an emotional response, making the debate personal rather than factual. This shifts the focus to defending oneself instead of the original issue, which helps them avoid scrutiny of their claims. 3. Lack of critical thinking skills. Many individuals promoting pseudo-information lack the critical thinking skills to engage in a substantive debate. When faced with well-reasoned arguments or evidence against their claims, they might feel overwhelmed or cornered. 
leading to frustration and personal attacks as a way to defend their ego. 4. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance occurs when someone is confronted with information that contradicts their deeply held beliefs. Instead of accepting this new information and rethinking their position, which can be uncomfortable or threatening, they may attack the person providing the contradictory evidence. This is a way to protect their worldview and avoid the discomfort of changing their beliefs. 5. Cult-like thinking and group identity. Pseudo-information is often tied to strong in-group-out-group -group thinking, where the person's identity or social status is linked to a particular belief or ideology. Calling out their information might feel like a personal attack on their identity or their group, so they respond in kind, attacking the person to defend their sense of belonging or status within their community. Lack of accountability. Since pseudo-scholars don't rely on verifiable facts, they may not feel the need to engage in civil discourse or adhere to the norms of respectful debate. Personal attacks allow them to dodge accountability and maintain their credibility among followers by turning the issue into a personal feud rather than addressing the factual weaknesses of their position. 7. Maintaining control over followers. For those with a following, personal attacks can be a way to rally their supporters. By framing critics as the enemy, they solidify their own position as a leader or truth-teller while demonizing anyone who challenges their narrative. This can prevent their followers from critically examining opposing viewpoints and reinforce loyalty to the pseudo-scholar. 8. Projection of Insecurity Often pseudo-scholars are insecure about their lack of expertise or the validity of their claims. Personal attacks serve as a defense mechanism, projecting their insecurity onto others. Instead of acknowledging gaps in their argument, they make the conversation about the personal shortcomings of their critics. 9. Avoiding logical discussion. Engaging in personal attacks allows them to avoid irrational, evidence-based discussion. If they lack the evidence to support their claims, attacking the person challenging them helps divert the conversation into an unproductive, emotional argument where facts become secondary. 10. Echo chamber effect. In environments where pseudo-information flourishes, e.g. certain social media bubbles, personal attacks can reinforce the echo chamber. If followers see critics being attacked rather than their ideas debated, it creates the illusion that the pseudo-scholar won the argument, even if the facts are on the critic's side. In sum, personal attacks are often a strategic or emotional defense mechanism used to deflect from the substance of the debate, maintain control over an audience, or avoid confronting evidence that undermines their position. Debating people who promote pseudo-information can be unproductive and even counterproductive for several reasons. Here's why engaging in a debate with them is often discouraged. 1. Lack of good faith engagement. People who spread pseudo-information often aren't interested in genuine dialogue or finding the truth. Instead, they may be more focused on winning the debate, preserving their belief system, or gaining followers. Since they may not be open to new evidence or reasoned arguments, the debate becomes a performance rather than a search for understanding. 2. The Gish-Gallop Tactic A common debate tactic used by pseudo-scholars is the Gish-Gallop, where they rapidly fire off numerous weak or false claims, making it impossible to address each one in a short amount of time. This overwhelms their opponent and can make it seem as though they have a strong argument, even though each point is flawed or misleading. Refuting every claim requires much more time and effort than making the claims, leading to a lopsided debate. 3. Spreading misinformation. Engaging with them publicly might inadvertently give their views more attention or credibility. Even if you refute their claims, merely debating them can expose a wider audience to their misinformation. People who aren't familiar with the subject may find it difficult to tell who is right, and the pseudo-scholars' ideas may gain traction simply by being discussed. 4. Confirmation Bias and Cognitive Dissonance People who spread pseudo-information often have a strong emotional or ideological attachment to their beliefs. Confronting them with facts that contradict their views can trigger cognitive dissonance, causing them to double down on their false beliefs rather than reconsider them. In many cases, presenting evidence only strengthens their position, as they interpret it as an attack on their identity or group. 5. Emotional manipulation. Pseudo-scholars often rely on emotional manipulation rather than logical reasoning. 
debating them may turn into an emotional argument where they use tactics like fear-mongering, personal attacks, or appeal to their audience's emotions rather than sticking to facts and reason. This can make the debate unproductive as it shifts away from evidence-based discussion and becomes about winning over the audience's emotions. 6. Time and Energy Drain Debating pseudo-information can be incredibly draining, as it requires significantly more time and effort to research, explain, and debunk falsehoods than it does to spread them. Engaging in such debates can pull you into an endless cycle of correcting the same false claims, with little chance of changing the other person's mind. The time spent in these debates could be used more productively in other areas where your energy and knowledge can make a difference. 7. False Equivalence by debating pseudo-scholars, you may unintentionally create a false equivalence between their views and legitimate, well-supported information. A public debate can make it seem as though both sides of the argument are equally valid, even if one side is based on solid evidence and the other is not. This can confuse the audience and lend undeserved legitimacy to the pseudo-information. 8. Echo Chambers and Audience Loyalty Many pseudo-scholars have a loyal following who are deeply entrenched in their belief systems. Debating them in front of their audience is unlikely to change anyone's mind. Instead, the audience may become more entrenched in their beliefs, seeing the pseudo-scholar as a hero or truth-teller fighting against an opponent you. The debate often turns into a spectacle where the pseudo-scholar rallies their base, even if their points are flawed or false. 9. Endless Goalpost Shifting in debates with people promoting pseudo-information, the goalposts are often shifted. When one claim is debunked, they may immediately move on to a new, unrelated claim without ever acknowledging the original error. This makes the debate futile, as there is no real endpoint or agreement on facts. 10. Undermining productive discussion. Engaging with pseudo-information often pulls attention away from meaningful and productive discussions. Instead of having conversations that promote understanding and real solutions, debating pseudo-information can bog down discourse in debunking myths and conspiracy theories, which takes away from time that could be spent advancing well-founded ideas. Better alternatives to debating. Instead of debating, you can share reliable information, focus on spreading accurate, well-sourced information in spaces where people are open to learning. Engage in one-on-one -on -one discussions, when possible, talk to people privately, away from an audience where they may be less defensive and more open to reason. Support fact-checking. Share fact-checking resources and articles that debunk false claims without directly engaging the pseudo-scholar. Educate, promote critical thinking and media literacy to help others spot pseudo-information and avoid falling for it in the first place. In short, Debating pseudo-scholars often results in little more than frustration, the spread of misinformation, and wasted time while doing little to change minds or advance productive dialogue.